I'll show you how to install and use my background skies assets for Blender. The idea with these skies is that you place them behind your main scene, so they act as the sky texture, rather than using the detail from an HDRI or a procedural sky system. There are over 200 skies, all sourced from real photography, and they have been developed into a 32-bit linear float format and edited accordingly, so they are genuine HDR images. This means they interact well with Blender's linear unbounded compositing and eventual filmic tone mapping. I'll cover installation first. I've got my JR Background Skies folder here, which I've extracted from the downloaded zip file, and inside it I'll see several Blend files and a catalog file. Within Blender, I'll first delete the default cube and default light. I then want to increase my clip end value for the viewport. To do this, I'll use N to bring up the N panel and switch to the View tab. I'll change the end value here to 80,000. You can put in a smaller value if you wish. This is just my arbitrary value that I tend to use. I'll also need to change the camera end clipping value as well. So I'll select the camera, go to the camera properties, and change the clip end value to 80,000. Now I'll add the JR Background Skies folder to my Assets Files list. I'll go to Edit, Preferences, and go to the File Paths section. I'll click the plus button, navigate to the JR Background Skies folder, enter it, then click Add Asset Library. I can now close the Preferences dialog. Now, by default, we don't get an Assets workspace in Blender, so we'll have to create one manually. I'll duplicate my current layout workspace, double-click, and rename it Assets. Then on the right-hand side, I'll change the outline of you to the Asset Browser. I'll expand the Asset Browser width and height, then switch the category from All to JR Background Skies. You'll see there are two categories, Background Skies and Horizon Blend Fog. I'll come back to the Blend Fog near the end of the video. For now, let's add a sky into the scene. I'll click-drag the first sky into the viewport and release the mouse button to place it. Then switch back to the layout view for now. Swinging the view round, you may notice that the sky isn't located where I actually dropped it. This is because of the camera tracking system. There is now a second camera in the scene, which has been imported with the sky. If I switch the active camera view to this camera, you'll see the sky object is aligned with this camera. It also has the modified clip end value. You can continue using this camera if you wish, but you may already have your own camera set up in your scene. If this is the case, we can delete this newly added camera and switch the active camera view back to the original camera. I'll select the sky object, then go to the Modifier Properties tab. This is a Geometry Nodes modifier that performs camera tracking. All I need to do is click into the Camera Input field and reference the camera I want to use. As soon as I do this, the sky will then align itself to the orientation of the camera. If I change the camera's rotation, you'll see that the sky stays aligned in front of it. I'll use Option G or Alt G to reset the camera's location, then Option R or Alt R to reset its rotation. Then I'll change the rotation x-axis to 90 degrees so it points straight ahead. Let's jump into the camera viewport and switch to a rendered view to actually see this sky. Although I typically work in cycles most of the time, these skies also work well in Eevee. If you enable Bloom, the emissive property of the sky material will produce a nice diffuse glow effect. Now I'll select the sky and walk you through the camera tracking settings. Distance from camera acts both as an adjustment for your camera field of view and as a compositional cropping tool. For example, if I'm rendering to a square one by one resolution, the sky does not fit the height of this ratio. Therefore, I'll need to adjust the distance from camera value until it fills the frame. I'll then change the resolution to a six by four aspect ratio, which the sky fits nicely. Horizon Offset allows you to shift the vertical position of the sky. This is useful if the sky has cropped top and bottom areas and you wish to reposition it within the camera view. Left-right offset then lets you shift the horizontal position of the sky. 
Again, if your sky is cropped, this lets you choose which area to show in the camera view. Sky scale is useful for adapting the sky to the size of your scene. For example, if you have a huge scene, the default position and size of the sky may encroach on your scene objects. In this scenario, you can increase the sky scale. This will increase the size of the sky, but also move it further away from the camera, leaving more room for your scene. Finally, Flip Sky flips the horizontal orientation of the sky. This is useful if you are trying to get a sky to match the direction of your light source. Next, I'll go through the sky material settings. Each sky has its own unique settings, accessed through the Material Properties tab. Emission Gamma is the power transform value applied to the emission input. Lowering the value will brighten and wash out the sky detail, whereas increasing it will darken and intensify the contrast of the sky detail. Emission strength controls the contribution of the emission. At zero, only the color input is being used. Raising the value will start to increase the strength of the sky lighting, and this will also backlight objects in your scene if the sky is close enough. Base color contribution just controls the amount of base color input. With most skies, this will only make a small difference unless you decrease the emission strength. Emission saturation dictates the color intensity of the emissive areas. This can be increased up to a value of 2, but do be careful, as the results can start to look garish. Base color saturation controls the color intensity of the base color input. Again, with most skies, you won't see much difference here but you can increase this value up to 5 for a small saturation boost. Base color brightness controls the brightness of the base color input. Like with the saturation setting, you can increase this up to 5 to make the overall sky brighter. Finally, you may have noticed the Horizon Blend Fog asset. I'll show you how to use this quickly. It's great for blending the sky horizon into the rest of your scene if the transition is looking too obvious. I'll drag the Horizon Blend Fog object into my scene here. Then I'll also change the Z location to zero, so it sits at the correct height relative to the camera. Now, back in the render view, I'll see that the fog obscures the horizon line quite nicely. Across on the Material Properties tab, I can experiment with the volume settings here. I'll try lowering the density so I can see more of the sky detail. Very small values are recommended here, so the volume doesn't become too overpowering. Light absorption changes the anisotropy. The default value works well within this context, but you are always welcome to experiment with it. Then finally, I can try changing the fog color. I can color pick off the orange wall here, then experiment further by altering the saturation. And there we go. That was a tutorial on using my background skies assets for Blender. I hope you found it useful, and thank you for watching.